Mason. And then the second decade has been the second decade has been uh, in Idaho in the Wood River Valley, uh, mitigating conflict with sheep and uh, wolves mostly. Um, so I have a, a short uh, PowerPoint here. We'll go over it's basically the SOP that uh, Lava Lake Lamb uh, uses that uh, we came up to help uh, mitigate conflict uh, with wolves. So let's see if I can. So can you see the presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So we use a, a multi-layered approach and uh, it's really set up to, to be pretty low maintenance, low labor, um, because this stuff, if it's complicated and hard to use, uh, they won't, people won't use it. I mean, that's just human nature that if it takes a lot of time, a lot of labor um, added to your day that people aren't just going to use it. And so uh, number one uh, deterrent or uh, conflict mitigation tool will be, would be the livestock guardian dogs. And we use a, uh, a combination of uh, Akbosh, uh, Pyre Pyrenees and Kangle. Um, they're kind of American white dog is the term that is most often used. And then those dogs are outfitted with uh, this collar and the screen has spikes. We've uh, kind of gotten away from the spikes, but uh, we use a flashing light uh, to, uh, it's, it's really kind of like psychological warfare where this is not a, this is not a barrier tool. This is a, uh, it's a deterrent. And it, what it does is create an uneasy um, setting for wolves. They're, they're very wary of new things. So uh, when they come in and look at a sheep band and there's a bunch of flashing lights going on, they get, uh, you know, a little, a little more skittish and a little less likely to uh, come in and cause trouble. Uh, it makes the dogs more effective. And then with that, uh, we use 24 inch Fox lights and then noise, uh, either a air horn or shotgun uh, with birdshot shop and then uh, we can also use night pinning which is setting up temporary uh, corrals with electric fencing and putting the sheep in overnight and that that works almost 100 percent but that's again one of those things that is time consuming and uh, labor intensive and number four is human presence and with sheep there's always a herder with the sheep band um, so uh, that is probably one of the primary things that uh, we use to deter um, conflict. And it's talking about the livestock guardian dogs. Uh, most of these sheep bands, this, this part of Idaho, there's probably in the summertime in the Forest Service allotments about 30,000 head of sheep. And a typical sheep band is about 2,000 head or so. So at least four dogs with a band. You got to have the right number of dogs. Um, too few and you really get into trouble. Um, and four seems to be the number of dogs that it takes to have a co cohesive pack uh, mentality going on that they work really well together. And, and really good dogs really make or break um, the protection of the sheep band. So the dogs are super important. And so the dogs wear uh, the protective collars, which I'll show you the most recent example uh, when this is over. But uh, with a flashing light. Um, this stuff is all passive and and it, so it's it's much easier to prevent the conflict before it happens. I mean, that's pretty logical that you want to do this stuff on the front end from the beginning rather than if you have an issue with a depredation and then start using this stuff, it, it's not as effective. And this and this stuff isn't 100% all the time. I mean, it's, there are instances where um, this non-lethal stuff will not work. And so I advocate that a full toolbox using lethal control methods and non-lethal control methods are always the best. Um, and there will be certain times when the lethal control will be warranted and will, you know, be the best solution for that problem. But the protective collars are three inch wide um, they're a Kevlar nylon hybrid, um, spiked uh, in the first uh, generations, and we kind of got away from the spike collar um, just because of uh, they're not very user friendly. Uh, if you have a, a big 100, 110 pound dog come up and love on you wearing a spike collar, um, you find out pretty quick uh, that your pants aren't going to last. So um, 
it can be a safety concern. And so we kind of gotten away with it and we're using the light as a deterrent and the safety for the dog. And dogs are defensive too only. Um, it's much better if they stay with a sheep band rather than go out and engage um, any any large carnivore. I've, I've seen them go out and chase black bear and go out and engage wolves. And that very rarely ends up well for the dog. Um, if the dog will stay with the band and with the other dogs, it, it's just preferable. Here, here are some of the tools, other tools besides the collar and the dogs. Um, what you see there are the fox light uh, and a starter pistol that they use uh, to make sound, noise, air horn, and just a small carrying case. And high lumen flashlight uh, can be used. And uh, one thing you will notice is pretty, pretty simple, pretty compact, pretty easy to transport. Here, these these sheep spend, they start out on the desert in the spring and they follow the green up, up into uh, the high country, uh, forest service allotments that are, you know, seven, 8,000 feet and timbered mountainous, mountainous terrain. So it's not like you're gonna be packing a lot of stuff out there to use. So this stuff has to all be lightweight and easy to uh, use, set up and use. And then something that we don't use very often, but is a hundred, almost a hundred percent effective, is night pinning. But uh, as far as deterring conflict, it's it's probably the best way you can go. But the labor involved in packing in uh, a big enough corral to hold two thousand sheep uh, kind of limits its usefulness. Um, and if there's no other option, and this is the last resort, then we will night pen, but it's not pref preferred just because of the labor and time and, and logistics. And then oftentimes the herder will go out, if the sheep band is away from his main camp, the herder will go out and spike camp with, with the sheep. So he's out there with them and can hear the dogs barking or if there's any anything going on. Uh, we've had, with the collars we've had, uh, this is my eighth season uh, with the project, advising the project in Lava Lake Lamb. And the last two seasons we used collars. We had two zero loss uh, seasons and with uh, wolf presence almost the entire season. And part of the reason we know that it was working pretty well is I put a GPS uh, location device on one of the dog collars. And so I have uh, locations for the dog and the sheep band. And then I got GPS locations from Idaho Fish and Game, which had a collared wolf in this allotment. And so I was able to look at those two locations and compare them that they were within close proximity for uh, most of the season. So, um, which is kind of nice to, to be able to see and, and confirm that uh, this stuff is working pretty well, so. And like I said, the gear has got to be ultra light, portable, and uh, we we're trying to refine stuff down to its basic form so that the very minimum is needed uh, for conflict mitigation. Uh, let's see, I don't know if this will play or not. Here you can see this is one of the first generations of collar had a single red and went to a a single blue flashing LED which I prefer because uh, canines um, are thought to see uh, the blue spectrum or ultraviolet spectrum better. And so we went with blue in the end. I'm not sure what this one is. This is also just flashing LED configuration. And this is a picture of the solar fox light that we use. And like I said, these are not these are not barrier tools. They won't stop wolves from coming in, but they set the mood. Um, the fox light has flashing lights that change colors and random times. And so they'll go off uh, from uh, dusk to dawn flashing light. And so it, it kind of sets the mood kind of a wolves aren't sure exactly 
uh, what's going on. And like I said, they're very neophobic. Uh, they don't like new things. They don't like change and they're pretty sensitive to anything new. And oftentimes come in and look at a sheet band and decide that it's not worth the risk and leave. And this is another picture of uh, Fox light in the field. Keep them pretty short, uh, modified uh, fence post, uh, plastic fence post. Um, so they're easy to, to carry and, and put up. And I believe that's the end of the PowerPoint. Okay. Hey, Kurt, uh, are there any questions? Uh, I was going to ask with the flashing lights, do those ever affect the sheep at all at night or the actual guard dogs or? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I often get that. Uh, the sheep don't care. And I often jokingly say that I don't think they're smart enough to, to, uh, know the difference, but it's just my opinion. Uh, they don't, they don't really, they don't notice it. It doesn't spook them. Um, and they don't really seem to care. Now the guard dogs, the colors we use are weighted. So it's at the back um of their head so i'm sure it affects their night vision uh, to some degree but um they don't really mind it either they don't really uh they don't seem to mind it anyway i it's hard to really say but they they go they do business uh, as usual with the collars on and most of these dogs are used to wearing a heavy spike collar because that was really what we used in the beginning was just spike collar for protection and uh here's Here's one of the collars with the, these are wheel spinner lights. Let's see. And they're motion, they're motion activated. And it's just a big, big, heavy dog collar. It goes on the dog. It gives some some bite protection, but really the light is what we're counting on for keeping the dogs and the wolves uh, apart. Um, the wheel spinner light is a light that uh, Wildlife Services came up for ear tags with, and uh, it's really cheap. And uh, it's supposed to go on a valve stem on a wheel, and uh, for decoration, I guess, when people drive, then it spins, and uh, so we. We were able to adapt that to the collar and and then also some ear tags for cattle. This this particular ear tag glows in the dark. I don't know. You probably can't see the the eye, and it also has a. This one's not flashing, but it. So, so it came. Tags run like those ear tags. How much are they? Um. These are custom made for me and they glow in the dark. So these are like, I want to say $3 for the tag and probably two bucks for the, for the flasher. So probably around $5, which is fairly expensive, but you could adapt this to just a regular ear tag and then the put, and then attach a wheel spinner light to that, that tag. I had this, this glow in the dark uh, eyeball idea in 2013. And so um, I had some made and uh, I, have a, I have a gal that custom, they have to be custom made. So there's a fair, there's a little bit more expense to them, but um, well, you know, yeah. trying to, trying to, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, yeah, I was going to say that's, that's pretty cheap. I was talking about the a rancher just uh, about a week ago. He was looking into like uh, either the, uh, the cell cellular enabled tags or the ones that communicate by satellite and GPS for his cattle. Right. So that they do get one actually killed, then they can go out and find it and hopefully get to the carcass to investigate before it's uh, too far gone. But I mean, you know, you're, he's talking, you know, by the time you get all the equipment and everything, it, it ends up being like 50 bucks a tag for one of the cell phones or like $75 a tag for one of the satellite. And at that point, you're right. not going to deter the wolf kill. You're just hoping to be able to get to the carcass, uh, you know, have a GPS location and get to a carcass to investigate. So it's a lot of money for a reactive, I guess, is what I'm getting at. So for, you know, five bucks, seems pretty cheap if it can help stop the kill in the first place. 
Right. That's that's the important thing to remember is that this, you know, this passive stuff, you, you put it on an animal and it's out there working. And uh, so you're you're heading off the conflict before it ever occurs, which is really preferable because once they come in and, and hit a sheep ban or kill calves or something, then they have that mindset that that's a free meal or that's an easy meal because killing killing a calf or killing a cow or a sheep is way easier than trying to kill an elk. Um, so um if you if you can if you can stop it before it ever happens i mean it's like i mean it's pretty logical that that just makes sense um and we could probably do these we could probably make these tags you you could just you could probably glue one of these uh wheel spinner lights on a commercial tag um so you could do it even cheaper i think um that's one of the things we've worked really hard on is uh i'm a big believer in the acronym guess keep it simple stupid uh, because, uh, you know, the, the more simple, the cheaper this stuff is, the more it's going to get used. If you got really expensive, hard to use stuff, I mean, that's, it's, it's great. And it probably works a hundred percent, uh, or, or really well, but if it's sitting in a bag or in a box in the back of a pickup or in somebody's shed, um, you're not really getting anywhere with it. So, and then, uh, this is just an example of Fladry. I don't know. You probably have maybe heard of Fladry. This is Turbo Fladry. And it's just uh, like flags you might see at a car, light, car lot uh, kind of thing. This is attached to electric fence uh, wire, so it can be electrified. Uh, this is a barrier tool. This, this tool is designed to be put up, and wolves, uh, as a general rule, won't cross this line. Um, it goes back to that neophobic uh fear they have of anything new been used for hundreds of years they used to use it to hunt wolves in germany i think is where it was first used uh to try to direct wolves to hunters that were waiting um but and this isn't 100 percent either this this sometimes you know it's it's hard to put up and you got to keep it off the ground so and sometimes it falls over and i'm not a big fan of it but it does have its applications yeah, you mentioned earlier that, you know, like these non-lethal deterrents, you really need to use them before you add depredation, before the pack learns that, hey, here's easy food. So, I right. mean, if you're in a situation where you've already had issue with depredation, what would you say is the best course of action for a rancher at that point? Uh, these tools um, are a good place to start. Um, I've many times stopped depredations with uh, Fox lights and some of the lighting stuff, then uh, then you also always have lethal control. Um, but the problem with lethal control, it's a short-term answer for a long-term problem because we found um, the last three years, uh, we've had um, packs removed for um, other reasons than um, mostly uh, depredating on, on cattle. But the next season, there's another wolf pack back in the same area, in the same allotment as the year before. So um, if you if you can if you can get a wolf pack that will respect these these conflict mitigation tools and eat elk and stay away from the sheep or calves, um, you're way better off because they're occupying a space. And if they are respecting the tools, they're keeping a pack out of there that may or may not respect the tools and and every every thing every time is different every pack is different depending upon the structure and how desperate they are how how experienced the pack members are um how how good they are at hunting elk um those those things are all different and different every time so you know nothing nothing is 100 percent um including lethal control because you can you can kill an entire pack of wolves and the very next season have a whole new pack of wolves uh back in the allotment so um there's nothing that's a hundred percent but um uh, to get back to your question i've uh, many several times had uh a depredation event uh we were deployed um and the depredation event was caused by us being lazy and not not expecting wolves to be where they were and so we weren't using any of the proactive passive stuff and so that's on us that, that we weren't doing our job and so we went back out and put this stuff up and then the rest of the season didn't have any any other issues and you know 
like I said in the beginning, it's a multi-layered approach. It's it's not just one thing. It's having a really for sheep. It's having a really good uh, sheep herder that's going out and checking the sheep and staying with the sheep, and then it's also having four really good dogs, and then this other stuff helps supplement all of that. So. Okay. So I get I, I kind of a follow up, I guess, is you know. <clears throat> In Oregon, a lot of people look across the border to Idaho and say, man, I wish we could have a wolf season during hunting season. Um, do you think that there's any significant impact to having a, a, a hunting season on wolves? Uh, does that have any impact at all, or is that something that should be considered? Uh, it's not a very popular uh, opinion, but my opinion has always been that I think it's important to have a hunting season uh, before 2000, I think 2010 was the first uh, time that they had an open season uh, on wolves. And um, before that time, the herders would tell me that wolves are, are less scared of human presence. Uh, they would see them all the time. They'd be during the daylight hours. And then after hunting season a few seasons they became uh less easy to see you don't see them rarely see wolves uh out in the allotment um, unless they're coming in and the dogs alert you that they're checking out a sheep band at uh, dusk or dawn you might get a look but um they they all feel all the herders feel that that made a, a sizable impact um on their fear of humans which i mean that's pretty logical that's pretty easy to put those two together and then I think um, when you're talking about wolves on the landscape, uh, hunting is important from a from a social tolerance perspective because all of the stakeholders need to feel like they have you know a hand in uh, you know the management, and I think that gives people a feeling that they can go out and do something um, to keep the numbers down and 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 be involved. In the management so i think although not popular i think it's i think it's an important thing to consider thank you any other questions you guys i can't thank you any all right um then i got i got one more tool okay. to show you real quick and then that's pretty much my spiel but this is a sound deterrent it's a uh it's a Bluetooth speaker, basically, and all this all this stuff I built off of Amazon. You can you can order it off off of Amazon, so it, you don't have to buy it uh, from somebody. And then using a uh, a simple Walmart cell phone, just a throwaway phone that you buy at Walmart to run an app, running a uh, recurring alarm app. This might be loud. I'll warn you now. So this is going to go off in a minute, but anyway, it's it's solar chargeable. Uh, the charge in the field, it's a uh, it's a sound deterrent, and you can deploy it in the field. It'll go off. You can set the alarm to go off once a minute, all day long, all night long, or at intervals or multiple alarms. Um, it's supposed to go off at 9:29, so we've got a little bit here, um, but it's pretty loud. Um, and you can build one of these off of Amazon, eBay for about 400 bucks. Uh, and then I adapted it to be solar chargeable. So it's just another tool in the toolbox, I suppose. Yeah, pretty neat. So do you just have it set up so it goes off like kind of like random times then? Yeah, um, the it is not random, but you can set multiple alarms so it can go off every 15 minutes uh, from dusk to dawn or every half hour. So you can set multiple alarms to go off together. And of course it didn't work this time. So, but it's, uh, it's pretty loud uh, and we can use uh, uh, whatever, you know, anything you can load on your phone for a sound you can use. Uh, on on the on this app, so it seemed like uh, a... 
That's it there. <laughs> I was just going to say, I was pretty sure I remember seeing a video where you had a crazy trade. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> wow. That's pretty neat. Pretty neat. Okay. Any other questions you guys? Or? Um, I was going to ask. Besides like humans or anything like that, do wolves have any sort of natural predator or anything that that actually scares them if they see it in the wild? Yeah, I don't know about what scares them, but uh, the most of the, of the mortality, like in Yellowstone National Park where humans aren't a big factor is wolf on wolf. Um, wolves are very territorial and they, they, uh, they get into skirmishes all the time and, and they, uh, they, I don't know if they're really scared of another pack, but they definitely respect borders and territories. And so uh, that would be the, the biggest factor other than humans uh, that they look for. So, um, yeah. Well, because I think that would weigh it. Okay, hopefully this thing's off now. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I was. Because I was just thinking, have you guys ever tried like a silhouette, you know, to make them think something, maybe like a silhouette of a human or something like that, so they think they see one standing there? Or... Yeah, that's that's a very good idea, and uh, we've used it at the lambing sheds, so they, they just put up a, like a rain jacket, uh, and it looked like a human form, and uh, that works um, pretty well, um, and for coyotes. And uh, the other thing I might mention about, um, it's kind of an idea I've had for a while, and but I can't ever get a wolf pack that, that sticks around long enough to try it, but wolves and coyotes um, are mortal enemies and wolves will control um, coyotes. Um, they, they kill coyotes on site. So anytime we've had wolf presence, um, We've had a lower number of coyotes, and coyotes are a way bigger problem than wolves are. Uh, wolves do not kill many sheep, and coyotes can kill a lot of sheep and do. Um, so, you know, using a more natural management style, I'd really love to have a, a stable pack that is respecting conflict mitigation tools um, that you could use to mitigate some of the conflict uh, with coyotes that uh, lessen their numbers. And then also elk, elk do a lot of damage to hay and haystacks. And um, if you had a stable wolf pack, you could maybe move, keep elk moving and, and keep them out of hay, hay fields a little bit better and, and a little bit lesser number. But yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea. And we, we have tried it and it does work. This thing's gonna keep going off, I think. Should be powered off now. Sorry about that. That's all good. All right. Any other questions, guys? Or? I think that's all of mine. Okay. Well, we really appreciate uh Kurt. This has been very interesting, very fascinating. Um and uh really appreciate you got somebody like you out there uh doing this work to try to help ranchers out because it's it's a challenge and uh so we it's really nice to know that somebody's out there trying to help out <clears throat> yeah we're working at it and it's a big issue and um you know i think the cheaper we can get this stuff and the easier to use the passive stuff uh the more it's going to get used and and maybe the less least uh less in the conflict a great deal and i really appreciate you inviting me um out to talk to you guys and uh you know, public speaking and uh, presentations aren't my strong suit doing the field work is, but uh, enjoyed talking to you fellas this morning. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Kurt. And hopefully yep. have you back again next year if you're up yep. for it. Yeah, anytime. All right. Sounds good. Take yep. care. Yep. Nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Bye. And we'll see.